Welcome to Critter Crusades, the show about ordinary people on extraordinary missions to help animals. I'm Missy Woodward. Today we have someone not quite so ordinary. He's done something quite extraordinary though for the animals. He's a political figure, someone who has to pass many different types of laws and work to help the entire community. But in this day, a very special day, he made something happen for the animals that's going to have a chain effect all over the city. We have a tape now from the LA City View which will show what happened on this monumental day. Let's go ahead and roll that tape. Thanks for joining us. I'm Ellen Chang. Los Angeles could soon become the first major no-kill city in the U.S. as it puts a new ordinance in the books. Anna Marcos was there as city leaders signed the historic spay-neuter ordinance into law. Chico and Cortisone have reason to be a little hyper. Council member Richard Alarcón's two pet chihuahuas are about to go under the neutering knife. Alarcón barely has time to wish them well as he drops them off at this parked spaymobile by City Hall. He's off to help the city make history with its first spay neuter ordinance. Chico and Cortisone are, are in there, father and son, uh, uh, but they were a little nervous. They're chihuahuas, they're by nature nervous, but. But, uh, uh, you know, you can't uh, just bark the bark, you got to walk the walk. A stroke of the mayor's pen and the measure becomes law. Starting in August, L.A.'s pet owners will be required to spay or neuter all their dogs and cats. For a $100 fee, some exemptions are allowed, such as those for breeding dogs, ranch dogs, and seeing eye dogs. City leaders say there's no law like it anywhere in the country. It will propel us to the forefront of becoming the first major municipal no-kill community in the United States. City leaders remind residents that if you're low income, the services are free. The city of L.A., the only city to offer free spaying and neutering services. A pair of cats or pair of dogs in one lifetime can see litters trail out to the tens of thousands. That's the truth. Spay and neuter your animal, you'll be happier, your animals will be happier, and we'll stop euthanizing thousands of animals a year. Runaway breeding adds 50,000 unwanted dogs and cats to LA streets each year. And last year, 15,000 of them got put to sleep. Supporters hope the new law makes unwanted, abandoned, and euthanized pets a thing of the past. I'm Anna Marcos for L.A. This Week. Authorities say spaying can reduce certain infections and cancers in female animals, while neutering reduces a male pet's inclination to roam or fight. For more information on how to get your pet spayed or neutered, call 1-800-FIX-PET or 1-800-349-7388. Well, now you saw the video and see what happened on a monumental day in Los Angeles. I'd like to welcome our guest. Councilman Richard Alarcon, welcome. It's a pleasure to be here, Missy. Well, this was an amazing day, but what was even more interesting was when that was playing, I saw the pride and the joy of when you saw your puppies on the, on the video, <laughs> and I said, now that's somebody that loves animals, and that's great, because what you've done, obviously, is something that's coming from the heart. Well, I don't know if it was pride and joy as much as <laughs> I was worried for them, <laughs> what they were going through. Um, they were very nervous, but uh, it, it was well worth it. And, uh, and I think my wife and I are very pleased that uh, the dogs were neutered. And, and uh, as I said then, you, you can't just implement a law without practicing what you preach. And so uh, it was appropriate. Great. Yeah. Well, we'll talk about the ordinance. Tell us what it is, what is the language, and who is mandated to uh, abide by this? Who is exempt and why? Well, although it is considered the most aggressive ordinance in the country, uh, in many ways I see it to be very forgiving. It, it exempts breeders who are registered properly with and recognized by the Department of Animal Regulations, working animals. Um, there, there are many different exemptions. Uh, you pay a fee and your dog uh, can be exempt. Any, any dog that a veterinarian uh, or dog or cat wants to exempt from this ordinance uh, can be exempted with a simple letter from a vet. So uh, we think it's very, uh, very forgiving. The, the target is to reduce euthanizations, reduce the number of stray animals, uh, and, and, and we think that, that this, this will uh, be a model for, uh, for hopefully the, the rest of the nation. What drove you to do this ordinance? You know, it's, it's very interesting. Uh, there's an animal rights activist named Phyllis Doherty who planted a seed in my brain when I ran for city council in 1993. 
and uh, she has slowly but surely been educating me and very patiently and politely uh, through the process and, and, and I, don't, I don't think I'm, I'm saying anything unusual here. I think the animal rights uh, activist community is a very interesting community, it is sometimes very demanding and sometimes very threatening quite frankly to uh, elected leaders. Uh, but Phyllis had been very methodically and, and uh, educating me to this issue, keeping me apprised of what was going on in the animal rights, uh, even when I went to the Senate uh, she kept me informed. So eventually, uh, I, when I ran for mayor, there was a, a humane uh, convening of all the candidates for mayor, and 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 I I committed to do everything I could to to gain a, a no-kill uh, position for the city of Los Angeles. When I came back as a city council member, uh, I felt I had to put my money where my mouth was, and I I was happy to introduce the ordinance. That's awesome. Well, it's uh, also convenient because uh, our co-producer happened to be there videotaping that day. So why don't we go ahead and show a clip from that to talk about what you really think is important and why you did it and what urged you on from another side. So yes. let's go ahead and roll that tape. Uh, so I am so pleased to see so many people coming out. Um, I want to share with you just, just a little story. I, my, uh, my son has a, a new girlfriend. After, uh, they've been together for six months, but I hadn't had the opportunity to meet her. And so I went to her house, and um, and uh, they introduced me to, to uh, Chocolate, their uh, pit bull. Yay! And, <laughs> and, uh, and uh, you know, it, it was amazing because uh, Chocolate, would, would, the first thing he did was, was go to his toy chest. And he was bringing, he was actually sorting through the toys, and and he, he was bringing me toys, uh, introducing his his best stuff to me, and um, and I just I, I don't know how you couldn't fall in love with uh, with chocolate. What a beautiful beautiful animal, and and I it, it reminded me that that's why when I was on the city council. Uh, I introduced a bill to a, a measure, an ordinance, I should say, to to increase the penalties on gang members who are creating war mongering animals out of gentle beings. I'm going to stand here and tell you that I'm an animal rights activist. You know, I, that that would be. Uh, that would not be painting the truest picture. You're the activist. You're the activist. Um, but I am a human rights activist. And I don't know how we can teach compassion uh, and reduce the homicide rate from 511 last year. Um, I don't know how we can get to real human compassion with the kind of treatment that we give to our animals. There is an absolute connection. There is an absolute connection between the violence on our streets and the violence that is placed on our animals. There is an absolute connection between the compassion that we need to build in Los Angeles to protect humans and the compassion we need to use to protect our animals. Indeed, it's the best way to educate kids about compassion is to use animals at home. And that's why my son trained and his girlfriend trained a gentle animal instead of a warmongering killer. And so I would offer you that coming from the Northeast San Fernando Valley, uh, now it's very different. I'm 51 years old. When I was born in the San Fernando Valley, uh, we had horses in our neighborhood. Uh, we had uh, we have many uh, equestrian functions in the Northeast San Fernando Valley. We had just about every kind of animal you could imagine. When I lived in Silmar uh, ten years ago, uh, I got a lot of flack from the press because I took issue with the person who lived behind my next door neighbor, uh, who had fifty roosters uh, tied to posts, fifty different posts, about ten feet apart from each other, and it it, it, it angered me. When even as a city council member, all I could get building and safety to do was put these little condos over them and say that they comply with the law. When you and I both know that the reason those 50 uh, uh, roosters were 
tied to the post was so that they could fight um, and kill. So when we look at our gang violence rate, when we look at our domestic violence rate, when we look at our uh, the, the, the violence that, that all of us fear, given certain circumstances, if you want to live in Los Angeles, then why are people surprised when we are treating our animals so badly that we are also treating humans badly? And so we need you. We need you to be the activist that you are. We need you to fight this fight. I think, uh, you know, I'm not the smartest guy in the world, but I think no kill means no kill. <laughs> and and it, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure that out. Uh, I would absolutely expedite the no-kill policy in the city of Los Angeles. Um, I would enforce the law. Um, it was, as, as a city council member, uh, it was on more than one occasion that we took on people who were destroying animal lives, not helping them. Uh, we did it in Sun Valley, not too far from where I grew up, where hundreds and hundreds of animals were dying and in decrepit conditions, putrid conditions. In fact, one reporter couldn't even go into the house where the woman had 60 cats living in her bedroom. Um, and so I think we need to create a more humane society. Uh, but I think that's the way to create a society that has respect for humans. Um, and so I'm, I'm with you. I am really with you, and I want you to be my guide as we develop a change in Los Angeles' heart, because that's what we need. Let's, let's empower our, 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 uh, our human beings by having them understand the connection between uh, the animal kingdom and, and our human lives. If we can't treat them with dignity, we will never know how to treat ourselves with dignity. That's amazing. That really s sums everything up as far as where a lot of your personal drive comes from. But also, you talked about something very important. No kill means no kill. Mm -hmm. And that's what so many of the people you mentioned, the um, humane rights groups, mm -hmm. they seem somewhat even threatening in the sense that it is a moment-to-moment -moment life and death situation. Unlike things in most organizations, it truly is. A life will be saved that moment if somebody can speak up for the animals. Um, did other council members join in and support you in this? Well, there were people who supported uh, the, the notions, uh, but nobody had put the, the ordinance in, put the, the motion in to create the ordinance. Uh, so having returned from the legislature for just a couple of weeks, this issue presented itself on the council floor, and I heard all the discussion, and I said, why are we waiting for Assemblymember Levine uh, to get his bill passed or, or, and, and trust that the governor will sign it, which, of course, you know he didn't, mm -hmm. um, when we can control this within our city. Mm -hmm. So I leaned over to Tony Carlos. I said, Tony, I'm, I'm ready to write the ordinance if you, if you want to help. And he said, he said absolutely. Uh, and so we introduced it, and he said, now you understand that you're going to get a lot of flack from the community. And I said, well, why are we here if, if not to solve problems? This is a problem that needs to be solved. But I also recognized that I had committed to do everything I could, uh, given the opportunity to reduce the killing of animals in, in our shelters. Um, and, and I believe we'll go far beyond that. So, so I was happy to introduce the motion. Uh, Tony supported it, and we were able to uh, get the community behind it. I have to give credit to Jim Bickard in the mayor's office. He worked with us uh, hand in hand to, to uh, get an ordinance that was reasonable and responsible. And also there's tax savings. I mean, this is something that I know when I would go to my neighborhood council or, or different uh, groups, uh, they've said something like there's an $18 per dollar spent of tax savings for every animal that's spayed or neutered because every animal that's not spayed or neutered, it's that many more animals that go into the shelter, mm -hmm. that many more that are killed. There's a huge cost of housing, taking care of, and eventually mm -hmm. killing animals in the shelters. Mm -hmm. It's not cheap. And I know in the state of California, it's costing about $250 million. I don't know what it is exactly in the city of Los Angeles. Well, it, it costs us $70 per animal euthanized. Uh, but it, if you imagine the, the, the costs uh, sort of cascade, uh, because if, if the less that an animal control officer has to deal with an animal, uh, the more we save. And so it's not just about saving dollars at the point of euthanization or, or uh, what would have been euthanization. It's all along the process. If we have people managing their animals more responsibly, 
the animal control officers can focus their efforts on those uh, truly criminals who are, who, who are breeding animals for the wrong purposes, uh, then I think the savings are, are much more than, than reducing the 15,000 euthanizations that, that occur in the city of Los Angeles each year. Um, it, it, it begins, as I said, to cascade, mm -hmm. and we save many more dollars. Well, and just one animal breeding over time, there's several thousand more that come along. So it's, it's that, that repetition that you're just trying to cut off. I know we're very, I'm very involved in a trap, neuter, and return of feral cats. And the issue is one cat will produce 10,000 over mm -hmm. a 10 year period of time or something with the amount. Mm -hmm. So we have this endless source of animals coming in. But when you get to how this is going to work in the city of Los Angeles. People were saying, oh, is this like Big Brother? Everybody's going to be looking at across mm -hmm. their neighbor's mm -hmm. yard and saying they've got ones. How do you foresee the enforcement working? Well, as a practical matter, we don't have enough animal regulations officers to go to every house mm -hmm. uh, to inspect. Uh, this will be complaint driven. So if somebody is having a problem with a dog in the neighborhood, uh, and they call animal control, the animal regs will come out and inspect to see if there's a violation. And if there is, uh, they will resolve it. As a practical matter, I don't think everybody's going to register their animals. I wish they would, but I don't think it's going to happen. But not everybody is handling their animals in a way that it would affect the community in a negative way, so it's not, that's not necessarily a problem. It's a problem when they have a dog that barks in the middle of the night. It's a problem when they, when they have an animal that, that isn't contained in their property. And, and is roaming the streets, uh, particularly when, when um, another animal is in the heat. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so as we educate the public on how to manage their dog, which is the primary purpose of this ordinance, is not enforcement, it is education. Um, we believe that it will reduce the, the, dramatically the need to, at the end of the process, euthanize an animal. And what is the education process? How do you see that acting out as far as utilizing this ordinance? Then. Well, upon the very first violation, uh, they are informed of, of what the law is. So if, if they are uh, found to be out of compliance with the law, they are given uh, a period of time to, to correct the problem. If they don't correct it, then they will be imposed with a fine. Uh, and, and then it, it, it increases as time goes on, uh, and they, they replicate the activity. But, but the first step in the process is education, and we think that's really important. Now, we also have Channel 35 to educate. This show is doing a great job. Thank you so much, Missy, for the work that you do. Uh, we're hoping to work with LA Unified to educate kids on right. how to better manage their animals. We have free uh, spay and neuter mobile clinics that will uh, do a better job of penetrating through the community. Again, informing the public on how to manage their animals correctly, most importantly, the children. Right, and I was going to say the information in, in all languages for everyone to understand. Also, one thing I know you've had uh, there's always in any kind of legislation towards animals, there's uh, opponents and proponents and the people that are uh, saying, oh, this isn't good or this won't work. It's some people fear that the animals, people will say, well, this is going to be a problem. I'm just going to turn my animal into the shelter then because I don't want to bother with this ordinance. I don't have the money to pay the bill or whatever. Are you going to, uh, and you know, they do need to get that animal fixed. Yes, if they're low income, you may have abilities. If there aren't funding, there isn't funding for that, what does that person do? Well, uh, first of all, um, Ed Box, the, the general manager of animal regulations, knows my feelings about animal regulations. It ain't perfect. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't expect that putting a, a massive new ordinance on the department is, is going to be handled perfectly. Uh, so uh, part of the job is getting the law passed, and then it's about implementation. Uh, I will continue to monitor. In fact, that's why we created a 15-member advisory group to see how we're doing because we, we expect that we're going to have glitches, we're going to have problems. So we will continue to work with the department to move them toward a transition that gets them to be most effective. Uh, and we recognize that they're not there now and, and not, not to, by their own choice, but frankly, they're underfunded in a lot of ways and, uh, and they, they, they have so much to do, particularly with the, the hardcore crimes that are occurring with animals uh, that, that absorb so much activity. Uh, we want them to move away from those activities and do more of the positive activities that they really enjoy doing. And I think that, that, uh, that it, it's going to be a, a process of time. In terms of the money, um, we have, we have uh, put money in the budget for the free spay and neuter uh, provisions. We have also uh, provided for discounts for low-income folks. We want to encourage people to get their animals spayed and neutered. There's, and, and frankly, I see no reason why anybody who wants to get their animals spayed or neutered wouldn't find a way to do it mm -hmm. in a way that they could afford it. 
And I know that it, all the animals that come out of the LA Animal Services have to be spayed and neutered, so that's another population that's obviously going mm -hmm. to be spayed and neutered. Um, as far as the uh, purpose of the ordinance, I hear what you're saying the purpose is. Can this be used by, let's say, the police or anyone that is going after the dog fighters, uh, people like that, as an additional way to go after them if they can't get to them in, in one way? Because, like you said, the LA Animal Services does not have enough workers. Mm -hmm. There's a task force that sometimes can get to things they can't. Does this help in any way for them to be able to say, well, if I can't get them because of this infraction, mm -hmm. which is maybe gang related or whatever, we can go at them from this way to get them for this and that way we can investigate more about what they have behind their fences and everything like that. I think uh, that clearly the ordinance will have a positive effect on that kind of dynamic. Uh, frankly, uh, prior to this, uh, Tony Cardenas had done a lot of work with violent animals and uh, the nexus between the responsibilities of the animal regulations and LAPD in their gang enforcement uh, programs. So the, the program was already uh, established and they are already working together. There are some specific measures uh, in place for that to occur, but this will help. This gives them um, a little more teeth, if you will, to uh, take a bite out of crime. How do you, uh, have you heard any word from other cities that have said something to you about this? Has it had sort of a um, shout across the world uh, effect at all? Have you heard from anyone? It, uh, the Humane Society has uh, let everybody know in the country that, that uh, this ordinance is in place. And, and yes, I, I'm hoping that, that it will have that effect. Immediately, uh, our focus has been on Lloyd Levine's uh, bill 1630, 1634. 1634. Right. There's a hearing on June 25th in the Senate. Uh, that we want to encourage everybody to send support, uh, send letters to their legislatures to support. Mm -hmm. uh, it is a statewide measure. Now it doesn't go as far as ours because ours is specific to Los Angeles. Uh, it requires spay and neuter after six months. It requires a contact with an animal control officer and the animal. Uh, so, but, so ours is a little more aggressive. But on a statewide basis, it does trigger local or local uh, jurisdictions to hopefully write their own law in a way that's tailored for their community. I can tell you that Dallas reached out to Bob Barker, who. <laughs> I've appointed to the advisory committee uh, for this ordinance, and I told Bob that well, let's go to Dallas and, and uh, show them what we did, and uh, and uh, so hope so. I think Dallas is a very good example of of people paying attention to what we did in Los Angeles, and hopefully it will spread across the nation. Well, I have to do something because I'm from Texas, and I there was a dog lying on the highway in in Dallas, and I called, and there was one one animal shelter in Dallas, mm. and it was and there was one volunteer handling everything. So it can make an impact, I think, somewhere in a, in a great fashion. This advisory committee you're talking about, so is it, who comprises this? Well, it's 15 members appointed, uh, one each from each council district. And uh, as I've said, I've appointed Bob Barker. The department will be implementing that um, and convening that group uh, to stay on, on top of, of not just the ordinance per se and the enforcement of the ordinance, but also marketing. What can we do to expand the information for, for uh, pe more people to know and, and to learn more about humane uh, treatment of animals in general? And so the advisory committee is going to have a very important function. But at the end of the day, at the end of a year, uh, they will uh, come back to council and report as to how the implementation of the ordinance is going. I should say that the ordinance is not fully implemented yet. Uh, we gave a grace period of uh, six months. Uh, it went into effect 35 days. So actually in October, uh, that is when the rubber meets the road and the department will be in, in uh, implementation mode. Uh, hopefully uh, there will be a quick education of folks and, and, uh, and then they will go into enforcement uh, steps. Do you think there will be more funding at some point for more animal services employees to be able to handle this? It's probably going to be a great surge, I would think, because those people in the animal humane community, they are going to report people that are violators. I mean, Quite frankly, I'd, I'd be lying to you if I, if I said that, that uh, there's going to be uh, a huge allocation of dollars. Now, there are facilities that are being constructed as we speak, one in my district, one in Tony's district, uh, but I, 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 this is the worst budget year that I can remember. Mm -hmm. uh, so we did everything we can to just shore up what we have. But I have, I have uh, this belief that the activist community uh, will fill in many gaps and they will be encouraged by this. They will uh, volunteer uh, to uh, provide services to the animal regs uh, department that they, that they need uh, and, and shore up some of those. those I, see the, I, th I think they see this as an opportunity to demonstrate to the rest of the country and the world for that matter that there's a better way to handle animals. And I would think that hopefully you could get in each of your district community business leaders that would help fund 
more free spay and neuter for these nonprofits who are already tapped out. You know, they are pretty much tapped out, mm -hmm. and that's a real problem. How do you see that the city council in these last minutes, how do you see the city council being able to work more effectively with the humane community, being able to um, not have so much dissension, but so, so much more conversation? You know, it's really interesting. Many of my colleagues uh, patted me on the back and said, well, wow, you, you, you dealt with them, and you really toughed it out, and what leadership. And I have to tell you, uh, I did not sense it. We did get a few phone calls and a few letters. Uh, and, and yes, we know that uh, some people were upset. But by and large, people have been supportive of this. It's sort of many people, even just average people, uh, sort of who, who reflect who I am, uh, who, who said, well, yeah, we really know. It's, it's not something they were focused on, but you know what? We really need to do this. And, and it's sort of, there's sort of a feeling of guilt, I think, that, that people have. And now, they, now they, they know that they have to be more responsible. So I think that, uh, that, that my colleagues will be encouraged by the fact that we got this done, the fact that I wasn't, uh, you know, people didn't throw things at me they like they had. They didn't grab have. their dog and pull you away. Yeah, they have, yeah, <laughs> and, and, and I think that hopefully they will also introduce uh, motions and actions in their own communities that will embellish what we did. That's what I was going to ask, and I'm glad you touched on that. In this last minute, I'm just going to ask you for 30 seconds soundbite of what is your wish for the animals in Los Angeles? Well, first of all, my wish is that we don't ever have to euthanize another animal. That's, that is a wish that we have to work toward. And I hope that uh, everybody else will believe that we can accomplish that. That's the first step in making it happen. Great. Thank you so much for all you've done. And to take that stand, it is something to go out there and, and go into that uh, unknown and say, I'm going to make this happen. And you made it happen. It happened very swiftly, too. So continue the good work. We'll be watching out for what you're doing. And thanks for joining us here. Thanks for joining us on Critter Crusades, the show about ordinary people on extraordinary missions to help animals go out and make a difference. Don't litter, spay and neuter. You can get active, you can go out, and you can go into your community and teach people about spay and neuter. Find your own way to get involved. There's plenty of groups, and you can go to the LA Animal Services and help there. Thank you for joining us. See you next time. Mm -hmm.